The Centre for Policy Development is very grateful for this opportunity to participate in your public hearing and make an opening statement. Uh, my name is Travis McLeod. I'm CPD's CEO. With me is Terry Moran, AC, CPD's Chairperson, and CPD Senior Policy Advisor, Francis Kitt. Terry and I are joining you from uh, Woundry Land in Melbourne and Francis from Gadigal Land in Sydney. We want to start by acknowledging the stellar work done by the Australian Public Service over what has been a truly relentless period uh, this past 20 months. Uh, whether during the bushfires or the pandemic, this period has underlined just how important the public service and public services are in the lives of all Australians. We've depended on them every minute of every day. CPD is a non-partisan independent policy institute. Uh, we work on long-term policy challenges and opportunities facing Australia and our near region. As our submission sets out, a chair public service capability to support more effective government has been at the heart of CPD's purpose since we were founded in 2007. Our work has included reports on the efficiency dividend and its impact, uh, the effectiveness of big service delivery systems, and research on Australian attitudes to our democracy and to government. We've also more recently helped to design and to implement uh, new approaches to delivering services, locally and regionally tailored service delivery approaches in key Australian communities, particularly those focused on addressing disadvantage and long-term unemployment. And those regions include Melbourne's West, uh, Toowoomba in Queensland, and in the Murray and Riverina regions in Victoria and New South Wales. CPD's view in a nutshell is that the problems with Australian public service capability are cultural, philosophical, managerial and situational. We'd like to make three points before taking questions. So first of all, the long run decline of APS capability is something that successive governments bear respons responsibility for, although the trend has accelerated since 2013. The cumulative impact of declining capability is frightening for Australia and Australian communities, and one that's been borne out by the vaccine rollout. We've seen the negative impact of capability gaps across CPD's domestic and international programs and across a range of substantive issues and service systems, including employment services, aged care, disability services, health, early childhood development, payment recovery, and systemic risks like climate change or pandemics. There's been a clear shift that we have noticed in the focus and orientation of the APS workforce, which is one of the key focus areas of this inquiry. This we have seen has resulted in an erosion of the quality of public service advice and ever diminishing number of people with long-term experience of large service delivery systems and the withdrawal of the APS from communities. The second key point is that the absence of APS employees on the ground in communities has been exacerbated by an obsession with contracting out the design and delivery of service systems to the market and an unhealthy reliance on outsourcing policy advice. The consequence is that the Commonwealth is increasingly vacating the ideas business and forgetting what it takes to run things well by itself or in partnership with others. Our research has shown that Australians want more effective and, and more active government stewardship of services and deeper engagement in local communities. Nine in 10 Australians now think it's important for government to maintain the capability and skills to deliver services directly instead of paying others to do it. And that number's up from three quarters of Australians in 2018. Our last uh, key point is that we believe repair and renewal of the APS should be a decade long race for Australia to have the world's best public service and public services. There have been some positive announcements since the Thodi review, including the new APS Academy recently launched, but much more can be done. This is what the COVID experience demands and it's what Australians want. Our attitudes research has shown that Australians share a unique resolve to make their democracy work, to solve big problems and to improve the lives of others. And it's through our, our blueprint for regional and community job deals that CPD has shown how we can change tack. Fundamentally, however, this does require reorganisation of government so that it's better nested in communities, better placed to partner with business and other levels of government to support and empower local community networks. 
And all of that will require smarter and more sustained investment in APS capability over the long run, reinforced by a clear-eyed view of the future that is bearing down on us, one in which our economy will decarbonise, our region will face increasing geopolitical unrest, and our communities will expect a smarter and more sustainable approach to care, education, development and prosperity. Uh, thank you, Chair. That's our opening statement. Terry, Francis and I are happy to take questions. Uh, Chair, before, before, you, before you start, uh, yes. could I just ask um, Dr McLeod to name the fourth of the topics, he, areas he covered, cultural, philosophical, managerial and? Situational. Thank Senator. you. Thanks, Chair. And, and when you say situational, um, you, you mean um, both in terms of geography, that is sort of re uh, regionalisation, but also um, whether or not it's um, direct capability or externalised capability. Is that right? Or does situational mean something more? No, precisely. Situational both in terms of geography and the nature of the work that is done. So in the sense that it's become increasingly a procurement function rather than actually in the weeds of doing the work and helping the work to take place in those communities? Well, it, it's a pretty gloomy submission and um, a, um, with a set of prescriptions, I suppose. Um, you know, the, the I'll, I'll take you in a moment to the third paragraph of the submission, which, you know, should send chills through people in terms of the the policy capability of the public service. Um, I did, uh, you know, I, look, look, looking at the CPD's board and your leadership, there is some deep public sector expertise there, along with some of the some people who've got, pro, you know, private sector uh, experience uh, in in policy design. Um, the, the the area that that you pointed to at the end there was the blueprints for regional um, or you know, regionalisation. I can't remember the title. Um, you know, to what extent that has there been, you know, the kind of observations that you're making, the kind of findings that are in your submission, the kind of expertise that sits on your board and your leadership and your research capability. What's, uh, What's the engagement with um, the Commonwealth and the state jurisdictions uh, look like? Um, is the blueprint the only example? And what are the key lessons from that um, from that blueprint experience that, that you'd put in front of the committee? Uh, thank you, Chair. So I think probably three parts to that question. And I'll take the first and then ask uh, Terry for his observations on the general trend. And then I'll ask uh, Francis to explain the community deals model in more detail. Um, but just a couple of key points. The first is that our engagement with uh, Commonwealth and state public services and local governments on this is very strong. Um, the view amongst our board and research committee and, and network is, a, I suppose, a growing lament that it didn't need to be this way. Um, you know, our chair wrote or was responsible for ahead of the game in 2010. And it's probably fair to say things have gone backwards since then. But if I just take one example, which the community deals model goes to, and that's employment services. So we've still got over a million Australians on the employment services caseload. So as at 30 June 2021, um, 1,013,452 Australians. Now, three quarters of those Australians have been there for over 12 months, more, of a, more than a third for over two years. Now, in the recent federal budget, there were um, 50 local jobs task forces that were created, which, which signalled an acceptance that employment services had to go regional and local in order to work. But the coordinators of each of those task forces are contracted. They have to reapply for their roles every six to 12 months. And nothing demonstrates the change of tack of, of public sector capability, I think, more than that. The jobs mountain is the biggest mountain we're going to have to climb out of the pandemic and we're going to be requiring on um, contracted um, uh, officials to coordinate that effort in our most vulnerable communities and that's not the best way of achieving impact and that's that's exactly the problem that our blueprint goes to but i might ask terry to offer his view on the trajectory chair if that's appropriate and then yes, ask to explain the blueprint in more detail uh, 
Chair, I don't know whether you can see my image. I can see everybody, but a uh, remark made earlier suggested that uh, I'm not coming through. I don't know how to fit, fix that, so I apologise. Uh, there should be a... Um, no, we can I, see. I mean, we're, content, we're, we're content to see you and not hear you, but there should be a little um, icon at the bottom next to the mute icon that you should be able to click on and should allow you to pop up. But if you can't see it, we'll, we'll proceed in any case. Uh, no, I've clicked the start there, video. There you are. Oh, you can see me. Oh, well, excellent. Very good. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, you're you're involved in a pretty complex uh, reference uh, chair that uh, is of immense importance to Australia, I think. Uh, for the Australian Public Service and the broader Australian public sector, for which the Commonwealth is responsible, it's not all black and dark. There are many areas of the public sector that are going very well. Um, the independent agencies, some of which are uh, admired and trusted in a, in a very strong way by the public, for instance, the Reserve Bank, they're all doing a very fine job and handling things very well. The Defence Forces are perhaps smaller than some would like them to be, but they are very, very, very capable. And Australia's defence is in the hands of some people that I, many of them I know, but I, I would uh, I would trust them with my life if I could put it as elaborately as that. Um, and other parts of our governance system work quite well. Uh, for instance, Treasury and some of the departments of state, but generally speaking, the social policy related departments are failing. And they're the ones that seem to be making most use of consultants and um, and all that follows from that, and they're getting it wrong repeatedly. So we've seen um, a decline in the effectiveness of employment services, which is totally outsourced by the Commonwealth. And uh, the simple reason for that, I think, is that people get jobs through networks at the local level. If you don't have a strategy <clears throat> that reaches down to communities on the local level, you don't get a result. Well, we know what's happened to aged care through the Royal Commission. That's an appalling disgrace. There are problems in the rollout of disability services. Um, generally speaking, health has really struggled with COVID-19 and the response to it. And um, particularly in terms of uh, the acquisition of and the rollout of uh, vaccines, it's uh, not been in great shape. There are major problems with early childhood development and of course, you've got the uh, the shameful episode of uh, trying to reclaim debt and without justification from disadvantaged people, uh, many of whom uh, had a shocking time psychologically and some of whom committed suicide. So all of these big problems lie within the social policy area of government. And so the question has to be asked, well, what's wrong? And uh, Part of it is capability. So the people in those areas tend not to actually have hands-on experience, recent hands-on experience, of the big systems operated by others that they deal with. So if you take the Department of Health, uh, I think about 83, 84% of their staff are based in Canberra. I can't imagine that they have people who've got regular close contact which with the residential aid care providers around the country so that they know what's going on. It's entirely a matter of uh, transactions largely based on paper. And this is all uh, steadily eroding the capability of those departments to serve their purpose and through that serve the people of Australia. So I'm a critic of outsourcing, uh, which probably wouldn't surprise you but I'm doing it on the basis of believing that it doesn't work. So there has been no reliable uh, examination in Australia that I've been able to find, which demonstrates that through outsourcing government services delivery, you get a result that is more efficient and more effective than what the public sector does. In fact, the reverse seems to be the case. So there is evidence in an examination of um, hospital systems in a number of countries, that Australia's pr public hospital system is more efficient and effective than our private hospital system. And if you've had any recent encounters with it, well, you'd understand why that is so. 
And the other side of it all is, is the emerging skills that are required in all organisations to do well in the world ahead of us, uh, most particularly encountering the digital environment. I hesitate to mention this, Chair, but, but recently I attempted to sign on to MyGov and I spent two hours doing it. And I came to the conclusion that if Amazon ran on that basis, Jeff Bezos would be very poor indeed. And I, I can't understand why Amazon can do a vastly better job than uh, the department in Canberra. But this is just one example of changing times, changing requirements, and parts of the public service being unable to keep, keep up. Yes, I've had recent bitter experience with the same thing. Uh, I'm pleased to hear that. <laughs> oh, I'm not, not in the sense that... Uh, that You're not alone. Uh, yeah, yeah right. but, but you understand what I'm saying. I do, I do. Yeah. Ms Kidd? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I can talk about the community deals approach in a little bit more detail um, and where we've been trying to support it. Um, so at CPD, I've been involved in some work in Melbourne's West, Toowoomba, and in the Murray and Riverina regions, but we've really walked alongside organisations designing and implementing locally tailored approaches to boosting social and particularly economic participation. Um, and really, we've, we've developed the blueprint for regional and community job deals, which draws on CPD's practice-based experience, as well as 20 case studies around about of service delivery models. And in essence, regional and community job deals is, is a service delivery model. Um, it provides a blueprint for an effective response by facilitating locally, regionally coordinated and tailored approaches to employment and training assistance. And they're a genuine partnership between government, business and community that allow a consortia of local actors to adapt programming locally to achieve concrete outcomes for their community. And these, these deals or community deals, they feature holistic tailored services wrapped around an individual and their family and strategic engagement of employers and local industry. And importantly, they do this in a way that's integrated into national and state service systems. I think in your, um, in your submission, you refer to the work of the British economist, um, Mariana Mazzucato. Is that, it sounds a bit like that, um, usually expressed at the national level set of principles, but a sort of um, uh, missions and partnership approach at the local level. Is that a fair way of describing? I, I think so. I mean, the blueprint's really designed to, to, to scale up the facilitation of employment pathways for disadvantaged job seekers. So moving beyond kind of principles at just at the local level, but um, put, putting in the national uh, and regional infrastructure um, to put them into practice. So it, it lays out some of those national level reforms that we think are required to do that scaling up, um, as well as the regional level um, arrangements that we think are required right down to those, those local level um, coordination. Now, I, I've got lots more questions, but as the chair, I've got some responsibility to, to um, sort of uh, ration my own questions and then hand it hand it over. I, and and if, if I get an opportunity to ask more questions at the end, I will. But I, I did just want to ask about the public attitude research. Um, it seems to me that there are strong views about public service capability in the community and interestingly, um, stronger views amongst um, people who identified as uh, coalition voters uh, than, than the already strong view across the community. I wonder if you could say a bit more about that research and what you think the implications of that uh, research are for, uh, for us. And secondly, I always ask a question in multiple parts. Um, secondly, does, does that mean that there are that there are that, that in that in diminishing public service capability there are consequences for people's confidence in the institutions of government and it has an impact on the strength of our democracy um is it is it is it is it too big to make that assertion or or, or what have you got to say about the research in terms of its implication for democratic norms no i don't think that's too big an assertion chair in fact what we found is that there's a there's a direct relationship between 
the esteem and trust Australians have in their democracy and the effectiveness of the institutions within it in delivering big service systems and in solving big problems. And I think what we've seen in terms of the trend of that question around capability is that as people's lives have been on the line and their livelihoods on the line over the past sort of 24 months, um, the number's gone up because Australians don't want governments to outsource that responsibility. They want them to claim it, to, to hold it. So when we first asked the question in 2017, it was around 73%, 75% of Australians thought it was important that government maintain the capability to deliver directly instead of paying others to do it, but also that they rated government service delivery above non-government service delivery across most of the criteria. And that's jumped to 90% um, when we asked it again last year. You did ask about coalition voters. So they are the strongest supporters of more active government. So 95% of Liberal or people who identified as Liberal and national voters um, wanted the government to maintain capability and skills to deliver services directly when we asked um, them that question last year. Um, the numbers strong across the board. It's, it's not a coloured result, but they were the strongest supporters. And just lastly, Senator, to your question about what inspired it, very much the Mazzucato approach. So what we want to stress is that this doesn't mean government does it exclusively. What this means is that the national mission is set and then government is organised to work in partnership with other levels of government, employers and community networks at the appropriate level to ensure the achievement of those outcomes tied to the mission, which is a different way of doing business, but it's one we think that's necessary for Australians over the next decade. I'm sorry, Senator, I think you're on mute. You know, I'm not very good at this. <laughs> um, the, could, could you spend a few minutes on on that? You know, that, that does seem to me to be a, uh, a, a different way of conceiving of the, the role of government and the work of government. It, it, um, it envisages a role for the private sector. It's not an exclusively uh, public sector role, but but what 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 does that Mazzucato approach, if we can call it that, um, offer in Australia? And what would be the key features be um, if um, you know what would it look like if the public sector adopted that approach to strengthening capability? And 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 are there other things that we you think that we should do? Possibly a question for all three of you before I hand it over. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll, I'll start and then go to Terry. So our mission is a bit like a moonshot. So the example um, Professor Mazzucato has used is going to the moon. And once that mission was set, it allowed the journey to that mission and the goals that would determine it to be co-designed by government, business, the scientific community and others that were participating in the achievement of that, of that endeavour. Now, we've seen this approach adopted by governments and institutions across the world, Chair, of all political persuasions. And in fact, it's it's also landed um, in Australia um, with some conviction. So when um, we brought out Professor Mazzucato, she spoke to around 1,400 people, met with a number of policy makers. And it's no coincidence that last year, our CSIRO launched 12 missions for recovery and resilience off the back of COVID and the bushfires. Now done well, what those missions can do is identify the capability gaps that are required in order to transition and turn the situation around in the achievement of that mission. It might be a full employment mission. It might be a mission around decarbonisation in um, the most carbon intensive communities and having a transition process to support that. But what it doesn't do is pit government against unions or employers or the community. It brings them together through that missions framework. Terry might like to add something on this because I know that he's given um, a big oration where he identified the missions that he thought Australian capability should be directed towards. If I may, Chair, um, I, um, I would add to what uh, Travers has said uh, an example. If I were looking for um, a moonshot that fits in with what the current government wants, it would be an approach to achieving far greater commercialisation of the results of research, particularly medical research. So what does that mean? Well, in the case of medical research, and I say this as a recently retired Deputy President of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne, um, in, in respect of uh, medical research, 
we've got the NHMRC grants program, and we've also got the $20 billion Medical Research Future Fund that Tony Abbott, and it's to his credit, conceived and introduced early in the time of his prime ministership. Now, neither of those grant making activities uh, have as a major issue how to achieve the commercialization of the results of research. So a moonshot would, uh, would try to get everybody reoriented in their thinking and would probably start to put some of that money into uh, supporting research across a number of institutes that could bring about uh, a significant uh, improvement which would lead to commercial activity. Um, instead, the, um, the Future Fund, established by Prime Minister Abbott, is no more now than just an ordinary grants giving program. So in this area, you've got basically three departments and a number of agencies with a stake. You've got the industry department that, that has to deal with uh, innovation and the future of the economy. <clears throat> you've got um, the health department and you've got the education department. So even, even trying to get the stakeholder departments involved in this is probably a big challenge. But basically what the public service has felt free to do is fall back on what the recipients or potential recipients of grants prefer, which is more, uh, more grants to do things rather than using money to oblige them to achieve some results of use to the economy. So I think that uh, Mariana Mascato, who's had that effect, as Travers mentioned, on the CSIRO, would be a very interesting uh, stimulant if you asked her to come and have a look at uh, what's happening with the commercialisation of the results of research funded by the Australian government. Because the answer to the question is, at the moment, not a great deal. And the only university that's had a long established success story in this is the University of Queensland. And you'd have to say, well, why can't the others do it? And I'm not sure what the answer to that is. And, and it, I, I think Dr. McLeod dobbed you in and said that you, you'd had a recent oration that set out a series of po po possible areas. I wondered if I noticed you might provide that. Um... Oh, certainly. But but could I make another point about that particular oration? What he's referring to is the Jim Carlton oration, which I delivered, I think, about two and a half oh, yes. years ago. And in that, um, I spoke about the importance of ideas as the basis for the emergence of policies. And that the ideas we've been running on for decades now, which centre around principally microeconomics, arguably aren't working as expected, aren't delivering the results, and we have to have some new ideas to drive the emergence of new policies over the next decade or so. And those new ideas uh, in some cases are predictable. What I've just spoken about would be one of them, but also climate change, um, having a more creative approach to handling Australia's relationships with China and the United States. It's that sort of stuff. And I, I modestly said these were just my views when I dropped them sure. into the latter part of the speech. But uh, yes, Travis but could... So, sorry, to but presumably that approach, you, you know, you what what you said earlier, I think, was that it's in the social policy areas, it's in the delivery of social services that this capability gap is the most profound. Presumably this approach offers some uh, possibilities in areas like aged care or disability care. Yeah, in that same speech, I argued for the concept of subsidiarity which is that you take responsibility for delivery down as far as you possibly can, down to the local level. Not everything can go down there, but a lot can. At the moment, we are massively over-centralised and it's not working. And so um, subsidiarity is, a, is also a sort of a, a, a big idea in one sense for Australia, Australian uh, ears, but it's well accepted in many parts of Europe. And it's also part of where the United States has been going. And um, in, um, I think there was mention made before of uh, Michael Gove, the Conservative Minister for the Cabinet Office in his Ditchley Foundation in 2020. He also spoke about uh, the need for government to have deep subject matter expertise, but relate effectively to the communities. 
And as you might know, uh, Prime Minister Johnston has put a particular focus on Westminster investing in some different communities in, uh, in Britain to those which have uh, been uh, receiving benefits in the past, particularly those uh, to the north. And so there's a lively debate occurring in other countries which hasn't hit our shores yet, uh, which are partly about, well, how you organise to do things, which is the story of subsidiarity. It's partly about what comes after uh, the fact that neoliberal economics has run its course and we, we can't claim universal success for everything that's been done. Mm -hmm. And it's partly about the, um, the requirement for governments to face up to the big issues and find a way to address them. And I suspect that many ministers feel when they turn to the public service in the social policy area, there's a lack of understanding, a lack of ideas, a lack of any, um, any ability to think their way into what it's like at the local level in uh, service delivery um, for which the Commonwealth is responsible. And I think it's so bad that, you know, David Thody uh, wrote about these issues in his report, as did I 10 years beforehand. Both have had no impact and so I think it's time to go back to what was done in the 70s, which is to have a serious Royal Commission. The one I'm thinking of there was the Coombs Royal Commission into the public service because parts of it, only parts of it, are not fit for purpose in the face of the challenges before Australia in the future. Yeah, it's one of the first things I did when we commenced this was to go back and read um, some of the material on the Coombs Royal Commission. And um, how many that, volumes did you get through, uh, Senator? Well, well, not many, not many. Um, I think the be the kindest way of describing it would be some, but enough to um, enough to learn quite a bit about that D different landscape, but but very similar principles uh, driving the thinking. Um, so could I just add one very quick point? The interesting thing about Coombs then was that he said what the Commonwealth needed to do is to find a way to work at the local level with states and local government to deliver services. And he actually trialled a couple of such centres, uh, which were then over time neglected because they didn't suit the purposes of the relevant Commonwealth departments. So the, so the, the subsidiarity theme is a very old theme. Yes, and Canberra you. doesn't get it in the public service. And when it when it pops up, uh, they often don't support it. Thank you. I might see if either Senator Chander or Senator Roberts has uh, questions for these witnesses. I do have a couple. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just wanted a bit of a quick overview of the Centre for Policy Development. Um, I've had a quick look at your website. Um, How's your organisation funded? Senator, um, our, the organisation is funded primarily by philanthropic um, foundations. That would be over sort of 70 per cent of our funding. Uh, we receive some corporate um, support, um, some community support um, from organisations and individuals. And we also receive some uh, government support from Australia and New Zealand for the work we do in Southeast Asia on forced migration. Mm -hmm. When you say you receive corporate support, what sort of um, corporate um, sponsorship are you like? What, what sort of businesses are, are providing you with um, donations? Well, they're listed on our website, but, um, but to give some examples, um, ANZ are among the supporters of our sustainable economy program. Um, the Australian Super are among the supporters of that program. We generally take contributions to our research fund at the program level or the organisational level. Mm -hmm. And that process is overseen by a research committee in our board. Yep. And I know your website says that you're an independent um, organisation, but Julian Burnside, who last I checked was a member of the Australian Greens as a patron, what sort of um, impact does a patron have on the policy development of your organisation? Senator, when, when CPD was founded in 2007, um, Fred Chaney, former Senator and, uh, and Julian Burnside were the inaugural patrons of the organisation um, and that's why they're listed on the website. They don't have any role in the day-to-day -day running of the organisation. 
Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, Dr McLeod, you um, briefly mentioned in your opening statement, or maybe it was your first response to um, Senator Ayres' questions, um, that the APS Academy um, is something that the uh, the centre thinks is, is operating quite well. I was hoping you might be able to elaborate on that for me. Well, I think, I mean, it's it's early days, right, Senator, because it's, it's only just been launched. I think one of the things we emphasise in our interactions with the Thody panel uh, in its review, and also in our submission to this and other related inquiries has been the importance of a professions mindset across the public sector to develop what they call public sector craft um, but also deep expertise in areas. Um, so we think that's a very positive development um, and, and should really, you know, make a vital contribution over the next decade or so. The other thing that's happened um, since we wrote the submission is the development of sort of professions across the APS or professional streams. And we note that David Gruen's running one on data professions and it's been terrific to see the work that the ABS have done, for example, on real time data release, particularly around employment um, through this pandemic. Um, so they're the two big developments that we think um, since we wrote the submission have been really encouraging. Yeah, great. And the committee certainly had a fulsome conversation with the APSC when they came in um, for a hearing a few months ago to talk through some of those policies as well. But good to hear that the uh, um, Centre for Policy Development thinks that they are going, or sh certainly showing promising signs. Um, that's probably all from me, Chair. I'm happy to hand over to Senator Roberts, who looks like he has a couple of questions. Thank you, Chair, and I do, and thank you for <laughs> attending today. Um, um, my questions go to the first three of your topics, cultural, philosophical, managerial, um, and I really only have two questions. The first is that what I see as a Senator is an absence of data driving decisions and policies, that then leads to a lack of objectivity, leads to a lack of planning, and without a planning, execution is haphazard and inefficient at best. Um, and then we uh -huh. see increasing politicisation, and that combined then leads to a politicisation, uh, political morass rather. Any comments? Uh, no comments, Senator, although we've noticed the data voids across our major initiatives. So we had a major initiative that ran for several years on employment and settlement services, and we started one last year on early childhood development. Now there is an example of data being held by different departments, often different jurisdictions, that isn't shared or made transparent in a way that would support better child development outcomes. And do you, sus do you, do you suspect that it's uh, not used internally and that the pol political objectives override the, the data? and the objectivity um, that data would provide? Uh, not only do we suspect, we have seen in our work on employment services that even the simple practice of sharing employment data between departments to identify what is working for disadvantaged cohorts does not happen uh, with the pace uh, or effectiveness that you might expect for such a, a significant unemployment caseload. So are you implying um, that it's not a lack of data necessarily, but it's a deliberate lack of sharing the data because it might tell a different story from the from the political story? Couldn't possibly speak to, to motive, Senator. As I understand it, often it's a case of simply being unable to share it between, between departments, not a question of not wanting to. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Moran, um, my next question and second last question just goes to your comment we are massively over-centralised, and I'm thinking here particularly of the state-federal responsibilities. Um, I was recently talking with a very well-regarded mayor of a community in, in uh, southern Queensland who said that the Commonwealth has the money, the state has the power, and the local government has the problem. Now, when we look at Aboriginal Communities on the Cape, for example, and my understanding is that some of the communities on the Cape are better than in Western Australia and Northern Territory. I've heard that objectively from people who've experienced all. But what we see is the state delivering some, some services to the Aboriginal communities. Um, we see the federal government funding some, but quite having contradictory purposes and initiatives. We see the local government caught in the, in the crossfire 
um, and lacking funding, lacking knowledge, lacking coordination. We see um, non-government organisations which are part of the Aboriginal industry that are taking money off the side and preventing it getting from the taxpayer to the Aboriginal on the ground in the communities. And we also see the, the uh, NGOs lacking accountability. Is this illustrative of what's going on? I think um, I'll make two, two comments, uh, Senator. Firstly, uh, local government across Australia um, has a capacity to do much, much more than they are currently being asked to do. And uh, apart from cases where sometimes some local government authorities are just huge, too large, like the Brisbane City Council is as big as the state of Tasmania's uh, government arrangements, mm -hmm. for example, um, as you would know, apart from a few instances like that, local government touches the ground and they're, they're, they're receiving intelligence all the time from their communities about what's going on and what works. Now, the Commonwealth in the social policy area, to a pretty considerable extent, lacks that. Uh, the states where they are working well also have their finger on the pulse of communities. And so I think that there are many things that uh, are centrally managed out of Canberra that could go down to states or go down to local government and the end result, if the management arrangements were well crafted, uh, the end result would be a very strong one. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by management arrangements. The, the, the way in which public hospitals are funded at the moment, where they're a joint Commonwealth state responsibility, is through what is called activity-based funding. So if you want a hip replacement, there's a standard amount of money that a hospital receives for all purposes to do that hip replacement for you. And the price or the amount of money that the hospital gets for your hip replacement is what's called the efficient price and it's independently set uh, by a body that uh, has the expertise to do so. Now, that, that simple concept with the addition of a, you know, a strategy uh, in a given area and a sense of um, what's required could make it comparatively easy over time to start to devolve more responsibility for delivery uh, to state governments and to local government. And in the case of local government, you'd probably agree that if anybody wanted to take a big step like that, there'd, there'd be a, uh, a serious uh, opportunity to invest in the further enhancement of the capabilities of local government so that the service delivery responsibilities taken over at that level would be uh, faultlessly executed. As it, stands at the mo as it stands at the moment, anything in the social policy area that uh, is managed out of Canberra seems to be facing problems. And we go after one big problem into another one, and it's, it's damaging the public's uh, respect for the national government. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Um, just one little question after that now, uh, after your comments. Should we be having, instead of a federal income tax, should we be having state taxes? Um, because then we would have accountability combined with service delivery. Well, Senator, if I were to agree with you on that point, I'd probably be shot when I walked out the front door by somebody from the state government. But um, um, there's no reason why that isn't possible. It works in America, as you no doubt know. And uh, you don't have to have one standard rate. And indeed, it was Malcolm Fraser who experimented with, with doing that, whereby, well, initially, a proportion of the income tax collected by the Commonwealth was ascribed to state governments. And uh, he was willing, uh, over time, to look at uh, then allowing state governments to vary the rate as it applied to their residents and I can't see um, why we couldn't uh, disinter that experience, examine it, and come up with a, with a model that would work in a contemporary sense. Yes, and I hasten to add that I'm not suggesting, and I'm not suggesting that you're suggesting either, that it is a tax in addition to, it is a tax instead of. Um, yeah, what, uh, what he did was, was take a proportion of... Um, 
income tax collections uh, at the Commonwealth level and ascribe it to the states, and there was no net increase. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. Look, thank you very much for this discussion. Um, for um, remarkable that we've managed to do it uh, with even just five minutes over time. So appreciate very much um, uh, the written submission and the discussion. Um, I think um, uh, I think you've given us a lot to think about.